Okay, we're going to wait just a few more seconds and then we'll get going. I see some more people. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. Um, as we move through here, if you want to go ahead and put your microphone on mute, just in case there's any background noise, it won't be distracting from everybody else. Um, and then we'll kind of go over Q&A, like how to ask questions as we're going through the demonstration. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with a few introductions here uh, in PowerPoint. So I'm going to share my screen with everybody. Okay, can you guys see my PowerPoint slide okay? Can we stream in live? Great, awesome. Well, thanks again for being here. So I'm Amanda Garcia. I am the program director for digital design, public relations and media marketing here at Tulane SOPA. Um, this is my email address. So feel free to reach out to me if you need um, anything after this or have any questions about anything related to the program, et cetera. And this is our Instagram and Facebook um, handle. So you can connect with us, see what we're up to, see what our students are up to. So you should have received an email with the files for today. Um, if you did not, you can visit this uh, site quickly and download them. Um, and we can get going here in a few minutes. Um, so we are recording this and it will be available for you to review. And um, we will send you a link within the next couple of days with a follow-up email. And we do have faculty who are monitoring this demo. So what we're asking is as we move through this, if you could please put any questions that you have in the chat box. We have a handful of faculty on right now. We have Samantha Barnes, say hey. We also have Professor Rebecca Carr as well. Um, and they will um, be able to answer any questions that you have move through. As you can imagine with this many people on at once, it will be really hard for me to answer every question. If I see things in the chat that are reoccurring, I'll make sure to go back and cover that again. Um, otherwise, it worked pretty well last time we did this where the faculty were monitoring and were able to answer questions as we went. So quickly, I want to give you an overview of Adobe Illustrator. Um, last week, we talked a little bit about Photoshop and what the purpose of Photoshop was. So just to reiterate that, the purpose of Photoshop is for editing images, right? Photoshop, like editing the photos uh, and combining photos, photo touch-ups. Today, we're talking about Adobe Illustrator, and this really is used for what is called vector image creation and vector editing. Um, we also use Illustrator for very small page layouts, like a poster or a menu. Um, you can add multiple pages or, or what we call art boards within Adobe Illustrator, but uh, because of the way that Illustrator links images and files, if you have a lot of things like a book or a magazine layout, you would want to do those in something like Adobe InDesign. So InDesign is really equipped to handle multi-page layout. Illustrator can do a few pages here and there and still perform pretty well, but Illustrator was designed for vector imaging and that's what we're going to be looking at today. And so thinking about these different platforms, really talking about raster versus vector images. So when we looked at Photoshop last week, we talked about Photoshop being for raster photos, which means pixel based, whereas vectors are points based or object based um, illustration. So down here at the bottom, you can see the orange circle is uh, represented by a vector shape and the pink is represented by a raster shape. Notice when they're scaled down really tiny, they look okay, but as we blow them up, you can see how the pixel-based image starts to get blurry or what we call pixelated, right? You've all heard that term, I'm sure. Um, and in this Apple logo, we've illustrated this even further, where this is what we perceive. As we were to zoom in, we would see the individual points, which we're gonna learn how to do today. This is using our pen tool. 
And then you see this little grid, if you can see the gray grid in the background, those are representing visual pixels, right? So this is what we would um, consider, you know, pixelated, uh, something that didn't have enough DPI dots per inch or pixels uh, per inch. And we would want to avoid scaling up this logo very large. Places we would need large things would be like a billboard or a really beautiful high resolution print ad perhaps. Um, we want to make sure that our logo's shapes are created with an illustrator. So whenever we blow them up, they maintain their high quality and smooth nature. Great, okay. So I'm gonna show you a couple of samples of student work um, that will help to kind of show you the capabilities of Illustrator. So this is the piece of student work by student Keegan Krause. And this is just a poster she did for um, a typeface, promoting a typeface called Avant Card Gothic. And so she did this entire thing in Adobe Illustrator. So in Illustrator, your typesetting, you can create these interesting vector um, illustrations or shapes in the background. She did all of her shading and coloration, as well as the overall poster layout within Adobe Illustrator. Uh, this is student Katie Stern, and this is an illustration of Lehan's Custard. It's super cute. She wants some Addies for this. And you can see that it makes an impact just using a monochromatic scale of this teal and the pink. And once again, this is all done in Illustrator with vector shapes. Um, this is student Jams. So same thing, right? So here for Katie, very simple line work. And here for Jamie, high, high definition. Uh, if we were to zoom in, you would see that all of these individual pieces or individual circles and shapes that she's used to create this illustration. And then also um, you will see, of course, a, a bulk of vector illustration for logos. So this is Cora, who also won Addies for this, and did this really cool illustration for a coffee shop for cyclists. So it's Bunny Hop Cyclery Cafe. And so this is a combination of different images with an illustrator to create the logo. And lastly, um, this is a menu also by student Katie Stern. And for a Bywater American Bistro, it's just a concept. And uh, so she did this menu layout in Illustrator. So once again, you can have multiple pages or artboards within Illustrator, but you want to keep it to a minimum. So she would have done all of these illustrations in Illustrator, the overall layout of the two pages as well as the type setting. And thank you again for joining us. We have additional events for April and May. We're going to go over a little bit. And of course, anytime you can visit our um, website for more information. So I'm going to go ahead and jump directly into Illustrator. And uh, hopefully, if you want to follow with me, you've already downloaded the free trial from Adobe. Or like I said before, feel free to just watch the demo. And then you can always go back to this later and play it as you try to click through. OK, so uh, let me go ahead and um, share. And I'm going to share my overall desktop. That way um, you can see my doc at the bottom of the screen. So let me go and close out PowerPoint. So at the bottom of the screen, see the Adobe Illustrator icon. So when you click on that, this is what will show up is the Illustrator um, interface. Okay, so I'm gonna give everybody just a moment to launch Illustrator. So once Illustrator launches, it should look something like this. So if you've not opened Illustrator before, I'm just going to give you a quick powwow, 30 second overview of what to expect here. So this is the, the screen that you will see when you click on the icon. You can do a couple of things. You can create a brand new file within Illustrator, or you can open a file that you've previously created over here. I'm basically my mouse over here. Okay. So also you'll see these options across the top where you can just click on, if you're gonna make a design for an iPhone, a website, a letter size, you can click on additional options. And anything that you've recently, and you can see my recent files down here, I would be able to click on those recent files. So we're gonna create, we're just gonna start quickly and before we get into the files that you downloaded, create a new file. So when you click on new, you're gonna get this dialog box, okay? Should say new document at the top. You're going to have a ton of options. It seems overwhelming, right? But the best place to start is here across the top. So once again, recent things that you've worked on, recent sizes, it will remember those. Any templates that you save, mobile, web, 
print, film, art, and illustration. So think to yourself, what is my end game, right? Am I going to be printing this file? I'm going to be publishing it to the web. Depending on what you're doing at the end, we're going to go to print, for example, here. That's what you want to click on and it will give you suggestions, okay? Over here, you will see that it will give you uh, set up a custom file size. So if I on a letter size or an A4 or a legal or a tabloid, and I need a custom size for something that I'm doing. Over here, I start by selecting my metrics. So if you're not familiar with points, these are units of measurement within typography. Uh, you know, for more on that topic, uh, you can take a typography class or two, and maybe we'll do a land nap on typography later. But points or picas are right here. And then you have your traditional inches, millimeters, centimeters, and pixels. So we're going to work in inches today just because everybody's super familiar with inches. So if you click on inches, let's create a file, highlight in here, that's five inches by five inches. So make sure it says IN, that means that you've successfully clicked on inches. And you can also say if you want a vertical or horizontal orientation, but because we're working in a square, it doesn't really matter. And in artboards, remember, are your total number of pages, okay? So you can click on additional pages or less pages. So I'm going to click on two artboards so that way we can confirm I've done this correctly. So to reiterate, what is your final output? We're going to pretend this is for print. I'm going to select inches from my metrics drop down here just to make it easy for today. And I can select uh, either letter, et cetera, or I can enter a custom size. I can orient it vertically or horizontally, the total number of artboards. And then I'm going to hit create down here at the bottom. And ta da, you will see this pop up. So hopefully, everybody's screen looks like this. We've gone through those steps correctly. All right, so I see a question coming in. If you're creating a logo, what would the final output be? Um, question. So if you're creating a logo, you can either say for or you can say for art and illustration, it doesn't matter because you'll be able to take that logo and we're going to save it as an EPS, et cetera. We'll get into that later. Uh, and then you will be putting that into additional files. So if you're creating a logo, I would say either for print or art and illustration, either way. It doesn't really matter because everything you're doing in here is going to be vector based. Okay, so this is what your screen should look like and you should see a toolbar. Everybody see their toolbar here. If you're missing your toolbar, this is just a little quiz. Uh, as we um, talked about last week with Photoshop, where you can find all of your tools is up here under the window tab. So same thing, if you're familiar with other Adobe products, it's the exact same. So up at the top, it says window, and I can scroll all of my quote unquote windows or palettes. So if I lose my tools, don't worry, it's right here under toolbars. Then you can click on a basic toolbar, which looks like this. Or under window toolbars, you can click on advanced and it gives you additional options within your toolbar. All right, so here's my toolbar. Um, notice, just in case you weren't here last week, if you're looking at these toolbars, you have a little X at the top that will close out that toolbar. Or you have this like series of little vertical lines. If you click on that, that's like a little handle, like a grip that will allow you to move your toolbar around the page easily. Okay. Um, also under window, this is where you can find things um, such as your color. Also, you've probably seen swatches. Everybody click on the word swatches. And this is what your swatches palette will look like. It will give you a set of preset colors. So once again, just under window swatches okay so if you forget where we found something most likely you're going to be able to find it under window under swatches you'll see there's a fill and a stroke so a fill is the inside of your shape and the stroke is the outline of your shape so to change the color of a fill you just click on any color and you'll notice it changes it to change the color of the stroke you click on the stroke and it will bring it to the front everybody see that if i'm on the fill and then i click on the stroke it brings it above or in front of the fill and then i can change the color Okay, so typically whenever we're creating shapes like we're going to do in a little bit, we're going to use a stroke that way we can see what we're doing with our lines and then we'll fill it in later. So later, we're going to be clicking on our fill and clicking on this right here, which means none. We don't want a fill. We only want a stroke. Okay, so we'll be playing with that later. Now, um, if you are looking for 
um, specific color ideas. This is something really fun that if you're just starting out is really fun to use. If you click over here on these three lines, it will give you additional options. And that's true for any toolbar. So any toolbar in Illustrator, InDesign, or Photoshop, if you see these three little lines right here, that means more. And so more options. And so here I can sort by the color names. I can select everything that's not used and delete it. I can create swatches. But something that you want to, I like to point out is open swatch library. So down here, once again, to get there, I went to more options, open swatch library. Here it will give you suggested color palettes. So if I go to art history and I go to impressionism, everybody see this path? I click on impressionism. And it will actually give me suggested, these are little folders, suggested folders on uh, Impressionism. And I can click on that folder and drag it into my main swatches palette. And now I have these beautifully curated color combinations and I can just click out of this and they'll stay in here. Um, something else people are always looking for is uh, Pantone color libraries, right? So if a client or, or like if you have your own company and um, you've got a Pantone color that you need to use, you just click on open swatch library and that's under color books. Okay, so we use the Pantone matching system mostly here in the US, but um, other parts of the world or true match is used as well. Um, so here, depending on what Pantone color book you have, at like palette coded or an uncoded solid, or I'll just hit solid code. It will give you every single color within the Pantone library and you can search for the one that you want and when you find it, you can just guess what you can do. You can click and drag it or if you just click on it, it will add it here to your overall master swatches palette. So last, lastly, just to recap, the three lines here gives you more options open swatch library you can have fun looking through all these different uh pre curated uh, you know previously curated uh, color palettes that makes it super easy for you and or color books is what you're looking for and color books will get you to all your great uh pantone books if you've heard of that before okay so color once again is found under window. Something else that we're going to be using in the future, not today, but in the future, you may need your type, your typography or your fonts, right? So if you go to window and you scroll all the way down to type at the bottom, you'll see something called your character and your paragraph uh, boxes, right? So your character, if we just let go there, it looks like this. So this is what we call our character palette. And on our character palette, you'll be able to find all your different type families and type faces within uh, your computer. You can also adjust the point size right here, just in this drop down. You can adjust what's called the letting, which is the space between the lines. Um, you can, for example, if I have selected my text box, you don't have to do this, I'm just giving you a demo. And I'm opening up my letting, which is the space between the lines, or I'm closing it or I'm making the point size larger or smaller. This is a little Jeopardy pro tip. Um, any type of body text or paragraph text you're using, your letting should always be three to four points larger than your text size. So if my text size is 10 point or 11 point, my letting should always be a minimum of 14 or 15. I like more letting, so I usually go a little bit more. Um, the space between the letters here, this is called your kerning or tracking. Okay, so individual space between individual letters is called kerning and tracking is the entire line, which is kind of what we're doing right now is tracking. You want to be careful with this, but this will help you if you have some uh, typefaces that have a lot of detail, you can use um, your kerning to make it a little bit more legible to read. And this is usually comes in handy for headline text. Okay, so point size, letting, kerning or tracking as well as changing your overall typefaces. Okay, we'll get into these tools that I'm clicking on in just a few moments. Okay, another super, super important palette uh, within Illustrator that we're gonna be talking about a lot today is our layers palette. So if you go up to window and you come down to layers, window layers, this is what my layers palette looks like. So as you can see, we have one layer that we're currently working on, okay? Um, we can see the layer, it has an eyeball. And I can also, right here next to it, I can lock 
you see the little lock symbol comes up. I can lock that layer so that I cannot move it, right? So once again, we'll get into this in a few minutes, but if I have a shape and I lock this layer, if I try to move the shape, you notice that I get this little no symbol <laughs> with my pencil or edit symbol that will not let me edit that layer because it is locked. So if you're building out designs or you're building out logos and you have multiple layers, you sometimes want to lock layers that are set in place and you don't want to be able to accidentally mess up. I'm going to unlock this layer. Now you can see that I can move it and edit it. Down here at the bottom of your layers palette, you can play with these later. We're going to look at creating a layer. So see the little plus sign? If you click on that, you can notice you can create a ton of layers. I can reorder these layers by clicking on that layer and I get a little hand and I can literally just drag and drop it wherever I want it. So if, for example, when we looked a minute ago in the PowerPoint of the little Creole cottage house and we looked at, you know, the frozen custard, Leon's frozen custard, there were many different layers of shapes. So what those students did is they had perhaps like a background layer and then you saw they were kind of monochromatic. So each layer could have its own color on it. Does that make sense? And then you can layer and move around the layers on top of one another so that way it looks as though it's a complete shape. Um, so once again, I can turn off my layer with a little eye here, so that way I don't see it if I want to hide that layer from myself visually while I'm editing, or I can lock that layer so that way I cannot move anything else on that layer. The different colors that you see here just represent um, how the image itself will be highlighted when you're selecting it. So notice that my, my black circle here has a blue line, and you'll notice that I have a blue line here. If I click on the pink layer and I make a circle, just notice, or an oval, uh, you can notice that because it's pink, corresponding outline is pink. So it's just to keep it, you know, kind of straight for you as you're working through. Um, something else that we're gonna look at in the demo file that I sent over is naming your layers. Uh, I find it super helpful when I'm working with a lot of layers to double click within here and give it a name. So why don't you try that? Why don't you try to just add a new layer and give it, double click in it, and give it a name. You can go back to your circle layer. I'm just going to call it circle that we were playing with earlier. So you can name these different layers. Now there's a ton of more tricks that we could do with layers, but because we're an hour today, I'm going to move on, but feel free to sort of like dig into this a little bit more uh, and learn what some of these other tools do, as well as how to move objects from layer to layer. Okay, and then last, we dig into the, I just wanted to give you an over couple of things here on our toolbar. You notice that I've been kind of clicking on these back and forth. These are your two main tools that you'll be using in Illustrator. One is our selection tool, the shortcut is in, uh, V as in Victor on your keyboard. If you're not within a text box, otherwise it'll just type the letter V. I'm currently typing out text and you hit the letter V on your keyboard it will take you to this tool automatically. So the selection tool allows you to select any object that's not locked and move it around the page. This counts for typography. Okay, so I can select, once again, my black pointer tool, I call it my, my pointer tool or my selection tool, and I can move this around the page to so type an image. The second is what we call our direct selection tool. So we have our overall selection tool, which allows us to select the whole object. I'm gonna zoom in here. And then we have our direct selection tool that allows us to directly select certain points that we're going to get into in a minute within that object and edit them. Okay. So if I were on my main selection tool and I tried to select the circle, I'm just moving the whole circle. But my direct selection tool allows me to directly click on objects and points and edit them as I move through this file. Those are the differences in those two tools. And we're really going to get into those in a few minutes. Um, as we kind of work through here. Um, another tool we're going to go into a few minutes is the tool. And then of course we have our type tool. So to create text um, in Illustrator, all you have to do is click on the type tool. You can click one time on the page and I can enter a headline. I can click and drag on the page and create a text box, right? Where I can then input a ton of text to. Now, here's a little quiz. If I need to now move the word hello, what do I move it with? I'm not going to move it with my text tool because I'm just going to keep 
clicking on the text. I have to move it with my selection tool. So I go back up here, click it and move it around. The shortcut to your text tool is just the letter T. So for example, if I am moving this oval and I hit the letter T on my keyboard, it takes me to my type tool. If I'm on my type tool right here and I click the letter V, it takes me back to my selection tool. So kind of learning your um, short, definitely Sam is telling everybody shortcuts at your friend, absolutely. Uh, learning shortcuts, Googling shortcuts are a really, really important part of being quick to use Illustrator. So we learned about our overall selection tool, our direct selection tool. We're gonna go over our pencil in a minute. We've got our type tool. You can make lines, line segments, etc. We've got our shape tool, which we're gonna get into momentarily, and a bunch of others, which we just don't have time to cover today. But feel free to play with them, reach out to us if you have any questions, and we'll definitely help you go through them, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about saving this file and how do we save a file in Illustrator. So I mean, obviously to save it, you go file, <laughs> save, or save as, right? So let's go ahead and go to file, save. And that's command S is your shortcut. Now I'm going to have a ton of options, well, six to be exact, down here at the bottom under format. Okay, so I can save as a root file. So your root file for Adobe Illustrator is a .ai. I can save as a PS, right, an encapsulated postscript file. And that will allow me to be able to support, once again, earlier we were talking about logos, right? So if I save this as an EPS, typically I'm just going to a single item perhaps as an EPS, it'll allow me to place this logo in different files, uh, in other Illustrator files or InDesign files, et cetera. A lot of printers like to use EPS files um, for exporting for them. Um, another thing that you would probably wanna save too is a PDF file. So, um, PDF file uh, will allow you to have a universal file, of course, as you know, for a PDF that you can open in a multitude of different applications. Something that I do want to say about a PDF is that if you have a PDF existing, if someone sends you, you should be able to open and edit that PDF in Adobe Illustrator, just a little sidebar there. So instead of opening it in Acrobat, if you need to make an edit to something that you happen to have, Illustrator many times, depending on how the files, the images and the text are linked and that kind of thing, it always work, but you might be able to as sort of a backup if you kind of get in a pinch. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and save this. And then as you're reviewing this video later, because I know this is a lot of information, on your drop down here, you have a ton of more options. So depending on if you need to send a file to a client via email, at the top here when it says preset, you can save it as a custom, an Illustrator default, a high printout, which is typically what you want to do, or a small file size. If you're just sending a small file for approval to a client or a friend, you can save it as small as file size. This is not something that allows you to go back and edit. See how this is unchecked, preserve Illustrator editing capabilities. So you would not want to save as this file size if you've got to go back and edit it later, okay? This is only if you need a secondary file to save uh, if you have an AI file and you need a secondary file to save, uh, to send to someone, um, you know, with an email or something like that. So typically when we're saving, we're doing a high quality print and that will allow us to come back and edit if we are saving as a, um, as a PDF. Okay, so we're gonna get into a few more tools such as panning and zooming, et cetera, when we open our new file, our demo file. So we're about halfway through. So let's go ahead and transition. Let's click on the X over here to get us out of this file. And I want you um, to go ahead and open our Illustrator demo file. You can open either the EPS or the AI that we emailed you. And I'm going to open, while you're doing that, I'm gonna open a demo file, um, a pen tool demo file that I created. So you don't have this file, okay? This is just for me, but I'm gonna use this as we go through this demo. So I'll give you just a second to open that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about our pen tool. So as we move through this, you're going to need to be able to zoom in and out very closely. You're also going to need to do something called panning or moving around the screen. So here's some quick shortcuts, depending on if you're on a Mac or a PC. If you're on a Mac, you hold down the command symbol and the minus key and that will allow you to zoom out. Command minus. 
in order to zoom in, command plus. So let's say we've command plus all the way here, or control plus or control minus if you're on a PC. But now I can't see what I actually want to see on the screen. So to pan or to move your visual space, you just hold down the space bar. And when you hold down the space bar, you get this little hand symbol. And then if you click and drag, you'll be able to sort of move around the board, okay? So I'm clicking and dragging just to show you. So once again, Command Plus, and then hold down the space bar, and that will allow you to pan. Use the hand to pan. So those are very similar sounding, I'm sorry. So Command Minus, Command Plus, Command Zero, just a little sidebar here, will get you to 100% of the artboard that you're on. I'm not using artboards in this file, so that's not really gonna work. But if whenever you're in your file, Command Zero will get you to 100% full screen. Okay, so I'm going to Command Minus, and then I'm gonna hold down my space bar to pan so you can get a good centered view of this. Okay, so once again, you do not have this file. This is my very big, overly exaggerated demo file for the pen tool. All right, so a couple things you can do with me as I'm going through this demo is look over here on your toolbar. Don't forget, if your toolbar isn't here, where do you find it? You can't answer me, but you go up to window and you go up to toolbars, okay? So window toolbars, and that will bring up your toolbar. So down here on your toolbar, you're gonna see your little, it says pen tool whenever you hover. Notice that there is a small little triangle to the right of that pen tool. That just means that there is more hiding under that tool. So if I click and hold it down, you will see that there is multiple options. Okay, the same thing goes for your type tool, for example. If I click and hold my type tool, I will see all these different, I bet you didn't even know these are here. So many different things you can do with the type tool, right? So once again, if you see, like on the shape tool, there's a little arrow and I hold it down, there's many different options for my shapes, okay? So same thing for my pen tool. If I hold it down, I see these four options for a pen tool and I can release on whichever one I want to use. So we have four different tools. Our, our main pen tool will just allow you to just draw the shape. The plus sign will allow you to do something called adding an anchor point, which we're gonna learn about. And deleting an anchor point and then um, adding or um, editing an anchor point, which is the last one that we're gonna learn about. But then also notice that there's another arrow over here on the right. Does everybody see this? And when I hover over it, see how it gets darker? This is what we call a tear off. And if I release on top of that tear off, this becomes its own little palette. I'm gonna do that again. I hold down the tool. I just come all the way over here on the right with another little teeny tiny arrow that you probably can't see on my screen. And I release, that allows me to tear off this little palette which is great. So I'm going to tear it off. If you cannot figure out how to do that, no worries. I'm just on the main pen tool over here. You just click on it, I'm on the pen tool, okay? So there's a couple of terms I'm going to introduce you to. The first term is called an anchor point. It anchors that point to your page. It allows that point to stay static in that space in which you create it, right? So my big obnoxious red dots, those are symbolizing ginormous anchor points. Typically anchor points look like this. You see how teeny tiny those little blue and white anchor points are? I realize you it's gonna be hard to see those. So I've made them obnoxious and red. Just know that those are not real, okay? They normally look like this, these tiny little blue anchor points. I'm trying to make it easy for you to see, okay? So to create straight lines, you will just click and release where you want those lines to be. So this is the tricky part about illustrating with the pen tool. Um, we kind of have to have a roadmap of where we want to go before we start using the pen tool. So you need to have an idea of what you want to create. I mean, hopefully before you dig into the pen tool, you're going to have an idea of what you're trying to make, whether it's an illustration of a bird or a pencil or an M in this case. We need to be able to visualize that just in our mind's eye on the screen. And that will kind of determine where we're going to be clicking. Another thing people like to do is create a sketch. So if, I mean, obviously you would create, we do this in our classes. Our students are creating sketches. They scan them in, they go up to file and place, and you can put your sketch and then lock it on a layer. Remember we talked locking things. And then you can trace with your pen tool over that sketch. So that's another way to directly visualize what needs to be illustrated with the pen tool. Okay, 
So there's a couple of ways to make a shape. The first is to make straight lines, right? We need to make straight lines. Imagine the uh, frozen custard illustration we just saw. It was a series of a ton of straight paths and lines. So we're gonna click and release with the pen tool where these red dots are. And I'm going to go ahead and do it. You don't need to do this, obviously. Just, just, just check out what I'm doing. I'm gonna click and release. I'm gonna move away from the point. I'm not holding down my mouse. I'm clicking and releasing. I'm moving away from the dot. Clicking and releasing. Clicking and releasing. Clicking and releasing, right? So you see how I have this weird white fill? That's because earlier when we talked about our swatches, we talked about not having a fill whenever we were illustrating. That way we can see our path, okay? Now when I'm done, I can just hit escape or I can go back to my V, right? Which is my selection tool. And now I have this path that I've made. And I did that by clicking and releasing, clicking and releasing. And I have just a single line path. Well, the problem with this is that I can't fill it in with anything. It's just a line, right? Now I can make my line up here. You might see your stroke palette. If you don't, you can go up to window stroke, okay? Uh, I can make my stroke thicker, but right now, if you look at your layers palette, we're just on the first layer and we're illustrating all of this, Nancy, just on one layer, okay? So I'm just working on a demo layer right now for you. Um, so yes, all the strokes, they're just individual visual objects on a specific layer that I'm working on right now. So I can't fill this in with a color. Like I said, I can make my stroke thicker, but I'm not actually filling it in. So what we want to do is create something called a closed path, okay? So to create what we call a closed path, um, I am going to start and finish at the same point to make what we call a shape, okay? So instead of just a path, we're going to make a shape. So to do this, and once again, you've got plenty of time to practice this in just a second. I'm just showing you. Let me make this a different color so you can see, okay? I'm going to click and release, right? Because I'm making a straight line. Click and release, click and release. I got that nasty fill again. Let me get rid of it real quick for y'all. I'm gonna click and release, click and release. And now I'm going to go back over here underneath my shape and I'm gonna add depth to it, right? If I wanted to, I could make a line here and then notice when I get close to my first point, what happens without moving my mouse. I need, I'm just going to talk about it. So that way you can see it. You see that little circle that to the right of my pentagon. That means that I am about to close the circle, close the loop. Okay. So that's what that means. And that's why this is a circular icon that I made. So I click back and now I have a closed shape. And when I try to fit, I can now have depth to my shape, if that makes sense, okay? So once again, I'm just undoing what I did here. You want to determine whether you need just a path illustration or if you need an actual shape, a closed shape. If you need a closed shape, you will always start and finish at the same point, okay? So the first way to make, to use your pen tool is to make straight lines. The second and more complex way is to make what we call <coughs> curves. Okay? And that is clicking and dragging. And what, what I've done here is made a very exaggerated uh, demonstration of what we call handles. So if I just click and drag, just to show you, notice that from this, I'm gonna escape and do it again, clicking and I'm dragging, I don't release the mouse, I click and drag. I get my center anchor point that I was making earlier, but now from that anchor point, I'm dragging out these handles. Notice that these handles are dependent of one another. If I go up on this side, I seesaw down on the other side, okay? They are dependent. If I make one longer, the other one gets longer. If I make one shorter, the other one gets shorter, okay? So as I'm moving through this, notice what's happening. And we're gonna try this in a second. These, these handles are tangent to the curve. I'm taking you back, taking you back to geometry, okay? These, uh, these handles are tangent to our curve and they also affect how steep that curve is. So I drag out my handles, the curve gets more steep. 
I drag them in, we almost go back to a straight line, right? So notice that these handles really affect the shape, okay, the way that our curve uh, ends up. Okay, I'm just hitting escape to get out of these and delete. Okay, so whenever I am creating, let me fix my little guy here so you can see what I'm doing. Whenever I'm creating a curved path, this is gonna take some, but that's why you can go back and watch this. And I put my pen tool, instead of click and release and click and release, because what is that doing? It's just making, right? I'm just making a straight path. What I want to do is make a curved path. So instead of clicking and releasing, I'm clicking and I'm dragging in the general direction that I'm about to move. So I'm gonna click and release, I'm sorry, click and drag, sorry, click and drag. Then after I'm done dragging, I release the mouse and I go up to where I think my next point needs to be. I click and drag and release, click and drag. So see how I'm trying to match this curve? Click and drag. I'm gonna give you a few more techniques in a minute. Come up to the top, click and drag, to the bottom, click and drag, okay? So I'm doing a few things here that may not be obvious to you, so let me point them out. So one thing you might be asking yourself is how the heck, if I'm drawing this from scratch, do I know where to put my points, right? Two things I want you to keep in mind. Number one, the name of the game is the fewer points possible, the better. So for example, if I'm trying to make this curve, and I'm putting in a bunch of points. Like this is, oh geez Louise, this is something, <laughs> I've gone too far. This is something that students try all the time. They try to make a curve with a bunch of points because the, um, the handles scare them, right? So what ends up happening? It looks very jagged because every time you make a point, it's trying to connect with either a curve or a straight line, right? So the more points, the more jagged. So the name of this game is the fewer, the smoother the curve, okay? So that's the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is, and this, once again, this is how I do it. A lot of designers have their own kind of way of illustrating, but I think for me, the best way that I like to visualize this is anywhere that your illustration is, the line itself is changing directions, that's where you put a point. So I'm going to obviously have a point where I'm starting and then I'm going to think to myself, okay, I'm moving up, 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 right? At what point do I start to change directions and move down? Well, it's going to be up here kind of on the apex, right? So I'm moving up and wherever I'm going to change direction, which is up here on the apex, I'm going to put a point and I'm going to click in. Okay. And then, okay, so now I'm moving down, down, down. At what point am I going to change directions? Well, it's down here in the valley. I'm gonna click and drag. And now I'm going up and I'm gonna change directions from going up to down. So I'm gonna put another point, if that makes sense. And then I'm gonna end my line segment here, okay? So the first thing, just right refreshing, fewer points, the better. The, the smoother your curves are gonna be. The second thing is to think about putting a point everywhere you're going to change direction. Okay, and then the, the last little pointer I'm going to give you before we talk about editing these tools is that if you hold down, like if I'm moving through here and I hold down the shift, everybody look at my, if I hold down the shift key, it's going to pop to 90 or 45s. So I'm holding down the shift key and it's not even letting me do this. This is without the shift key. This is with the shift key. So if I hold the shift key, and I'm able to pull out a straight line. I can really, like I click down here, hold down, shift, click and drag out. It will allow me to have a lot of control on my curves. You don't always need to use the shift key, although some people do. They only illustrate using shift. So that way everything is either vertical, 100% vertical or 100% horizontal, which is an interesting way to do it. That way everything has very consistent curvature. You can totally do that. Um, I don't necessarily do that all the time but that is a really great way to control your curves. So the fewer points, the better, a point everywhere you change directions and holding down shift to kind of control those handles, those tangents to the curve. Okay, one last little thing and then we're gonna jump into the demo file. This is something called your anchor point editing tool. I made a big illustration of it here. What that allows me to do is if I'm on this tool, which is, excuse me, right here, and I click on any of my anchor points, 
it will allow me to take an anchor point that was member dependent on one another. Remember my anchor point here is dependent, those handles, right? I'm gonna make a little shape so you can see it. It will allow me to break that dependency. So I go from having them being dependent to independent. So if I go to my anchor point tool and I click within the anchor point itself or on the end of one of the handles, now notice that I can edit, if I go back to my direct selection tool, edit these, ah, I can edit these individual handles themselves and they're independent of one another. We're not gonna get into too much of that in the demo, but I just wanted to show you this, what that tool does so you can do it later. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into your file. All right, so I'm going to zoom, command plus, 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 and pan over to my shape. Let me zoom out a little bit. So what I've done in your file is I've set up an open circle of everywhere you should be starting and stopping your path. And I have a hot pink circle everywhere I think you should be clicking. You can add as many points as you want for fun if you want to do a different shape. But these are just practice. I've locked them, right? So if we go to our layers palette, this is my layers palette. I've locked these two layers so you can't accidentally and I cannot accidentally move them. And I've left an open layer. I can double click and open or an edit layer up here for you so that you can draw on this layer if that makes sense, okay? If you don't see this open or edit layer in your file, just click on a new layer right here, create a new layer. And then that will give you a little, you can start playing with and editing on. Okay. So let's try this. So everybody go to your pen tool. Something else I want you to do is open up your swatches palette like we looked at earlier, Windows swatches. I want you to go to your fill and hit none. Go to your stroke and pick any color you want. I'm using this like bright green because it seems to show up well on the screen. So click on your fill and go to none. Click on your stroke and pick a color as you like. Not a gradient. <laughs> okay, so we're not having a fill and we're having a bright stroke and I'm gonna close this. So we're on our pen tool and remember to start where the open circle is. Most people like to go clockwise around the shape as you're drawing a shape, okay? Okay, so let's click and release. Remember, we're making straight lines. Click and release, click and release, click and release, click and release. We're gonna go back to our first shape and you'll get that little circle by your arm and click and release. Now we know our shape is done. Notice my pen tool no longer is dragging a line. Our shape is closed. Down here at the bottom of your tool palette, you'll see this little icon that's a switch. I can switch my fill and my stroke. So you can see that yes, I indeed closed my path. Okay. All right, I'm gonna hold down this, the space bar and pan over to my triangle. Go back to your pen tool, make sure under your swatches palette as we move through these that you do not have a fill, but your stroke, you click on your stroke to be on top is a color. All right, my circle with my open circles where I'm gonna start, I'm gonna click and release, click and release, click release, go back to my first, you'll get the little circle, click and release. I'm gonna hold down my space bar to pan. Here's our M we did earlier. Now you get to try, so click and release. Click and release. And do that for all of these pink points. Go back to your very first and you'll get that little circle to close up your shape. Okay, so now let's try some curves. This is the tricky part. Remember, we're still on our regular pen tool. Everybody try to click and drag. Now I'm gonna hold down the shift that we talked about earlier. Click and drag straight out, okay? So anytime you're making an oval or a circle, I would start by clicking and dragging straight out. We'll go over why in a second. Now move your mouse down here at the bottom, let go of shift, click at the bottom, click and drag 
out in the direction that you're moving. I'm moving this way. So I'm dragging, I'm still holding down shift into this direction. Now look at how my line is not perfect, okay? It doesn't match up with what I did earlier perfectly. That's okay. The idea for this is to just get a shape on the page and then we'll use our editing tools in a moment to edit. We're also gonna go back up to our first shape, click and drag, our first anchor point, click and drag, and then release. So notice that I have like an Easter egg shape here and I want it to be more of an oval, okay? Now we're gonna go to that direct selection tool, that white tool, the second one down that we talked about earlier. We're gonna click on that tool and you'll be able to click on your handles. I'm still gonna hold down shift and drag these handles out at the top and the bottom to get it exactly where I want it, okay? You can also sort of play with this shape if you would like, whatever you would like to do. It's just a fun little demo. But notice that once I got my shape generally created, now I can go back and I can perfect my lines using my handles. You can also, I'm gonna zoom in here to show you what I'm doing. I can also click directly with my direct selection tool on my anchor point and I can move the whole bottom of this shape. Okay, command minus to zoom out, space bar to pan. I was doing this. I'm gonna hold down the space bar to pan over here. And on your circle tool, I'm gonna go back, um, a circle shape, I'm gonna go back to my pen tool, click and drag, I'm gonna hold down shift to get my handles nice and straight. I'm gonna click and drag, I'm gonna hold down shift again. I'm gonna come down to the bottom, click and drag, hold down shift again. Over on the side, click and drag and hold down shift. Go back up to the top, click and drag and hold down shift. So once your shape is closed, you can go back to that direct selection tool and I can click on the anchor point and get my handles. See, so right now, if nothing is selected, if I go to my direct selection tool and I click on the handle and right in the middle of that anchor point, I will get my handles. So now I can click on the individual handles and I can adjust them and bring them in. Now, this is just a demo of how to create these shapes. Really the easiest thing to do is when you're trying to make circles or squares, et cetera, over here on your toolbar, you're gonna probably see the ellipse tool as your default. If you hold that down, you can create a rectangle or a square just by using these tools. And if you hold down shift, it'll make a perfect square, right? So we don't necessarily need to draw a circle. If we needed a circle, we would just come over here to the toolbar, go to ellipse, hold down shift and make a perfect circle. Notice that there are one, two, three, four anchor points, right? Remember, we want the fewer anchor points, the better, because it'll make a smooth shape. So you should work, you know, we tell our students work smarter, right? Make sure that when you're creating shapes that already exist, like an oval, you can just use your oval or ellipse tool, okay? Okay, and then the last shape is a combination of curves and straight lines. And I'm gonna do this demo and you can go back and watch it to really hone in on what I'm doing. But I'm gonna start at this first point and I'm gonna click and drag because I'm moving clockwise. I'm moving toward this direction, right? And I know this is gonna be a curve. So I'm gonna click and drag toward the curve. I'm gonna click and drag this way. I could also add one to the center here if I wanted. Now look what happens when I come down to create this point. You see how it's still curving? One way to mitigate that is to then click again on the point and now you will have a straight line. Click and release, click and release. I'm gonna go back to this first point. Notice I still get my closed shape tool and I'm gonna click and release. So now I'm gonna go back to my direct selection tool, my second from the top, and click on these handles until I get this exactly how I want it. In a couple of weeks, we have a, another um, demo where we're gonna be talking about creating um, compound shapes using shape tool, shape building. And so we're gonna get more into how you could use the Pathfinder tool to create a circle and a square and minus those two things out. But because we're running short on time, I'm gonna pan down here to the bottom 
And we're gonna look at this last little piece that I want you to play with. Okay, so this is a very familiar logo, obviously, right? This is the Nike swoosh. And basically it is just a combination of curved shapes and straight lines, right? We have our Bezier curve here. We have a straight stroke here, another curve. So what I would like you to do is to anticipate, you only need four points to draw this entire shape. Where would you put these points? Okay, notice when you try to click and drag these circles, what's happening? You can't do it. Why is that? What did we talk about earlier? Over here, remember your layers are locked. So I named this for you Nike layer. So if you unclick the lock, now you should be able to click on these circles. So if we're going to start, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go to my selection tool, the very first one to select the whole shape and not just a point on the shape. And I'd like you to move these circles. So once again, use the top right here on our selection toolbar, the very first tool. If I start here, where is my next point? I want you to really think about this, okay? So I'm clicking and dragging, where would my next point need to be? Um, so you could do this a couple of ways. Um, we are changing directions here, right? Somewhere in here. And then we're gonna obviously be changing directions here, right? We're going from, it's gonna be somewhere around there. We're gonna change directions from going this way to going down. Then I'm gonna change directions somewhere along here to go up and then I'm gonna close it up again at that first point. So you can sort of play with this um, using the tools that we just talked about and um, kind of play with the shape and drawing the shape. But just really think about everywhere that you're changing direction, that's where you're going to want to put a shape, okay? So keeping in mind that you're starting here, we're going down here, and then we're changing to moving up. So this is where we want a point. We're moving along this way, and we're about to completely change directions here, right? So this is where we need a point. We're moving down, 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 down. We're starting to go up here. So that's where we need a point, so where we move upward. And then we're going to get that close shape tool right here at the end to close it up, okay? So you can play with uh, kind of, you know, redraw, lock this for you. So you can work with your pin tool to try to trace the Nike logo, but overall, Basically, what I want you to take away from this is that using the pen tool and you can start to perfect it, you can add points and take away points at a time. But as you're rewatching this or you're practicing with these points, think about every time you change direction, where do you need a point? Are you moving in the direction of where a curve is going to be or a straight line is going to be? And think about, do you need to click and drag, right? Or do you need to click and release, you know, based on um, the direction of your line. Where are you heading? Okay. Um, and don't forget over here on your toolbar, there are different shapes that you can use to make your life easier. Um, I can make a rectangle or square tool. I can go over here to my minus tool and then I can make a triangle, right? So once again, think, uh, think about ways to uh, work a little bit smarter and save yourself time. Okay, so we're almost done here. Uh, I know that was a lot of information. Hey, Lewis, it's good to see you. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks again for joining us. So if you have any questions, um, once again, feel free to uh, email me. It's just amandagarcia at tulane.edu. Um, and we'll be sending you guys an email um, within the next 24 to 48 hours of the video recording of this, as well as our contact information. Um, if you need anything else. So thank you guys. We're out of time, but it was great to see you all today. Thanks.